morning. Good morning. I think I'm on. Good morning and welcome to the March 1st meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Lowe? Here. Commission Alternate Hurst? Here. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Coonerty? Here. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Yeah, I didn't Here. See you Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Chase? Here. Commissioner Bator? Here. Having a quorum, we will move on and open oral communications. This is the time to address the Regional Transportation Commission about items that are under our purview. You we'll have three minutes. Uh, please come forward. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Saint from Aptos. <clears throat> In the first uh, order of businesses, we are changing our name from Campaign for Sensible Transportation to Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. So just to make a note of that and we'll get all that stuff spread out. Uh, basically, the first thing I'd like to do is to, uh, again, express CFST support for how much, how you're spending your major defunds on most of your projects. Um, primarily and also to remind you that we still have a strong opposition to the Ox Lane project. We feel it's uh, basically a waste of funds. Um, we do mention SB1 a lot as a possible funding source from the state of California. Uh, and actually some people have been basically calling this the road bill. Um, that could be confusing, but in actuality, the focus of SB1 is on road, roadway maintenance and not expansion. Uh, basically, most of the funds will go for that purpose, and only 5% of those funds will go for congestion relief. Um, and they've actually said that it, does, it excludes highway widening projects, uh, other than express lane or HOV lanes, which you actually have in the tier one thing, but we all, all, all believe that are out of our ability to fund anyway. Uh, there's no mention of ox lanes in the SB1 funding. Uh, by contrast, public transit, is receiving 10% of SB1 funds. So with the SB1 road maintenance funds, cities across the state can use new local and regional funding measures, i.e. Measure D, for focusing on building a world-class regional transportation system, uh, which would provide mobility for our growing population. Uh, SB1 has moved us forward on a pathway to a more sustainable transportation future for Californians. Uh, my question is, why isn't the SCCRTC joining California on this sustainable path? One quickie here, I gotta flip over my sheet. CFST is recommending moving funds from Ox Lane projects to mass transit options, i.e. bus rapid transit, expand and assist Metro in increasing its ridership and focus more on possible options for the use of the rail corridor. We also support the funds that you're gonna uh, talk about today and transferring it over to Metro for the electric bus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Good morning. Hi, Gail McNulty. Um, I am with Santa Cruz County Greenway, but primarily my remarks today are those of a resident of the county, um, more so than someone representing our group. I, very little of this has been approved by my board, just for the record. Um, yesterday's Sentinel um, announced that the Santa Cruz City Council unanimously declared a fiscal emergency on Tuesday afternoon, preparing to place a revenue raising sales tax measure before voters on the June ballot. Um, the sales tax would funnel an estimated $3 million in new revenu revenue annually into the city's general fund, which primarily pays for services such as police, fire, and parks. Um, CalPERS, cities across California are scrambling to get out ahead of a looming, looming budget definites, deficits as employees' pension costs are expected to nearly double by the year 2025. Education. It's expensive to live here and our teachers are underpaid. Pajaro Valley teachers in particular need more money. These are just a few of the financial challenges that we're facing as a county and as cities. Um, 
Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz City, Watsonville, Capitola, Scotts Valley, none of these places have money to throw away. So why are we still talking about a train that we can't afford that won't help gridlock? I'm a teacher and I brought a bunch of handouts today. Um, I'm gonna pass these around. First of all, here's a picture. Um, transportation's rapidly evolving. We have a picture of Daisy, who we currently have on our tracks. We have a picture of Ollie. Ollie is the future of transportation. Ollie is a point-to-point -point little thing that could probably coexist on the corridor with bicycles. It could be a small-scale transit option on the corridor that could get people to and from where they need to go. Here's a little graph of the places that support, support daily commuter rail systems. The majority of them, over half of them, over three million people. Then we get into a small amount here, two million people. Over here we have a handful that are a million or, or you know, at least a million, all connecting to major metropolitan areas. Then down here we have Santa Cruz County. A train is never gonna make fiscal sense for our community. We simply don't have the tax base to support it. It's also not gonna help gridlock. Our own RTC studies say it's not gonna do it. 50%, maybe 60% of people, according to Caltrans, when they're on Highway 1, they get to 17, they go over the hill to Silicon Valley. That train would not help any of those people. And just um, Campaign for Sustainable, Transportation is working on their Transportation Justice Conference. So this is just some my personal thoughts about transportation justice in this county. I, my last job before this one was as a teacher at a hard to sc staff school in the Bronx and I cared very deeply about social equity. Um, so this is something I think a lot about. We've got, we need real solutions. Those people sitting in, tr in gridlock on the highway, they need real answers, not a fantasy train. Okay, we're gonna get into rail banking later. It's something we want to seriously consider. We'll get into that later, but I'm gonna hand all Thank of this you. around to you and um, it's just food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us in oral communications? Good morning. <clears throat> Marilyn Garrett, retired Pajaro Valley teacher. I can uh, sympathize with what the previous speaker was saying. However, I keep thinking of, I said this yesterday at the board meeting and it prevalent in my mind, often the bumper sticker that said, it will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. When we look at the pie of federal money and where it's going, approximately half goes to the military. We need funds to be, this pie needs to be shifted where social services, transportation, parks, schools, et cetera, have all the money they need. And we need it with a safe technology. I just got off the bus 71 bus coming here. And I, I must say, um, the drivers of the bus are so skilled, not only in their driving and making, making sure the situation's safe, but in conversations with the riders. Uh, the driver today was just wonderful. There was an elderly man who was, you could tell he was not in very good shape. She had had previous conversations with him. It was a very sympathetic conversation and he, you know, it, 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 like doing, I mean, just being kind. She was, I was so impressed. Um, Drivers also know what's safe, and I want to tell you about an accident that occurred um, by Soquel Drive and Trout Gulch. A friend witnessed it, and a bus driver reported on it at the Metro meeting. And it was exactly what bus drivers have been saying to me when I talk to them and say, do you know they're planning to move the bus stop from where it is by Soquel Drive near Trout Gulch to the intersection before the intersection of Trout Gulch as you're heading towards Santa Cruz. Bus drivers, uh, I wrote down some of the comments. One said, that's not going to work. That's gonna back up traffic even worse than it is. Another said, 
people will be trying to go around the bus as it's at the signal stop, and it's illegal to turn right around the bus. Well, exactly, and bus drivers don't seem to be consulted very often on what's coming in the future. Sure enough, within the last week or two, this bus driver happened to know her for Pajaro Schools, was turning right from Soquel Drive going up Trout Gulch, and a Prius tried to turn right, uh, and on the right side of her scrape, just what so was predicted. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give you something on uh, wireless technology dangerous warnings from scientists please, Ms. Garrett, going please. way back. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask uh, Mr. Dondero if there's any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agenda. Uh, <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, we have handouts for item 16, the director's report, and um, item 22, uh, correspondence from the public. Okay, then we'll... Uh, yeah. No, uh, we're, I, we're not gonna get into a debate about uh, something said at Oralcom. Uh, Okay, please make it brief. It'll be brief. The bus, the bus that uh, had an accident was a school bus, had nothing to do with the uh, Metro Transit and nothing to do with the Metro bus stop. It was at an intersection. That's it. Okay, well now we'll move on to uh, the consent agenda. Uh, I'll see if any members of the commission have any items that they wanna pull or comment on. Look at my right. Now look to my left. Uh, uh, Mr. Bertrand. John, the uh, director's report, um, as well, that's on the regular agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. That's on the right. We're, do we're doing the consent agenda. No I'll see if there's any member of the public. Do you have a brief comment or would you like an item pulled? Um, actually, I'm, I have a brief comment. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, first of all, Measure D, um, Highway 9, I, I don't see a lot of details in terms of what's going to happen there, but I do hope that when we look at bicycle infrastructure and ways to improve Highway 9, we are thinking about actually separating bikes from cars physically. I know that in San Lorenzo Valley, um, Parents and the community have opted to stop doing bike to school day because it's simply not safe to do it there. So we need some serious changes. Quite honestly, I think as a county, we should think about stopping doing these, you know, bike to school, bike to work days until we make it actually physically more safe to be biking around our county. Um, also, when it comes to Measure D, please, um, I understand we need to do storm repair, things that are infringing on property owners. I would ask personally that you please do not put money into repairing the tracks this at this time because that both symbolically and physically represents something that may or may not be what we consider to be the best use of the corridor at the end of the Unified Corridor Study. Also, I personally wish that the public um, with the Oversight Committee would have a chance to weigh in um, before the money was spent instead of after the fact. I know it's not maybe traditionally what happens, but it would be nice. Um, I have some more handouts. I have lots of handouts today. Um, since the information items seldom contain things that are not with a pro-train bias, um, I've brought some of my own information items. Um, I don't know if there's a way to add it into the minutes or not, but there's an editorial. Okay, try, to, try, to, try to keep this to items that are on the consent agenda. Well, we this had is the information items. The um, so it's an editorial. Do you want to refer to the specific item that you're commenting on? I have requested over and over again that we start adding some information items that are not simply pro-train biased. Um, so I've brought some of my own. May I please just say what they are? We have an oral, we have an oral communication portion. That is the time to talk about items that are not on the agenda. Okay, well You're then I will just about the consent hand agenda. these around. But That's these are fine. information items that should be taken into account because we need to be looking at things Thank other you. than rail. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us about consent items? Please let us know which consent item you're going to be speaking to. Item, I believe it's uh, 12, miscellaneous communication. <coughs> okay. I assume that's on the consent agenda. It is. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Leopold and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller, and I'm here this morning representing the Friends of the Rail and Trail. I wanted to draw your attention to two letters that were submitted to you. Unfortunately, I missed the deadline last week. I thought we had an extra day because of the holiday, but uh, anyway, I uh, emailed those separately to you. They're also included in the um, a, additional packet here this morning. <coughs> One of the letters has to do with progressive rail as a choice. Um, you know, I've been looking into their 
uh, business plan, and I'm continue to be impressed with the thoroughness of their due diligence. I trust I see you have a closed session later today. I encourage you to continue the negotiations with them. They look like a pretty stellar operation. The second one is this uh, letter I wrote about the um, propane distribution uh, facility. I was here at your last meeting speaking about this relative safety of rail versus highway transport, but I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that Mountain Propane here in Felton, a local propane provider in our county, is uh, has a propane distribution facility underway in Watsonville. And so the idea that this is some horrible thing that might happen in our county, uh, it's the point is moot. Thank you for your time and service to our county. Thank you. Um, now I would uh, entertain a motion about our consent agenda. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. second. Motion by Rockin, seconded by Coonerty. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion carries unanimously. With that, we will move on to the regular agenda. Item number 14 is commissioner reports on RTC related items. Are there commissioners who would like to address us? Um, I will just uh, briefly say that uh, as I mentioned at our last meeting, we are working on a, a, a number of study sessions for our commission. Um, we have some people that we've uh, identified uh, and some that we continue to wor work with. Uh, Jeffrey Tumlin, who's a principal um, at Nelson Nygaard Consultants, will be, be talking, uh, I'm working on the final details, but transit, housing, the relationships, uh, dynamics, densities, what that's all about. Um, we are working with the Rail to Trails uh, organization about a discussion about the uh, rail banking, the process, the cost and requirements. Uh, we uh, are likely, uh, you're there is gonna be a Santa Cruz Chamber of Commerce trip on May 11th uh, to the, the Smart Train up in um, um, Marin in Sonoma. Uh, I would uh, advise you to, to mark that date on your calendar um, because uh, if you wanna see what that train's about, uh, this is an opportunity. Um, I've gotten some suggestions about some trails that we're gonna visit and as well, uh, but uh, rather than organizing a separate RTC trip, we would uh, join in with the chamber and the RTC would pay the cost. Uh, so if you could mark that and, um, and as soon as we get the official information from the chamber, we'll send it out and we'll ask for your uh, participation or, or find out. We are gonna be looking also at the future of transportation funding, financing, and fares. Um, and we're gonna be looking about equity uh, in planning decisions, integrated transport s systems, and also future transportation trends and uh, first and last mile programs. Um, so we're trying to find a speaker or speakers who could address this um, and we'll hopefully have a, a full list uh, by the end of m this month. We're not gonna be doing it on March 15th. The, uh, Mr. Dondera, did you wanna add anything? Um, just I wanted to clarify I, that I, I believe that your um, suggestion about uh, going on the SMART trip was directed towards the commission members? Yes. And not <laughs> towards the public at large? Yes. Um, okay. Just uh, well, I appreciate the clarification. Yes. Uh, we're not paying for everybody's tri <laughs> trip on the, uh, 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 to this. But a as I mentioned, you know, since we're gonna be making decisions um, at the end of this year, we're trying to help provide as much information possible about larger transportation policy issues. And in specific, um, uh, we know that uh, people are, are interested in the rails question and the trails question, and so we wanna provide field trips. And when we heard the chamber was providing one to the smart train, thought that would be a good one for our uh, commissioners to take advantage of, so. Um, if there's uh, no one else uh, to uh, make a report, uh, then we'll move on to item number 15, which is appointment of commissioners to the Budget and Administration and Personnel Committee. Um, that's my report as well. Uh, the uh, members who have expressed interest is uh, myself, uh, Supervisor Friend, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, Supervisor McPherson, and uh, Council Member Bertrand. So unless we have anybody else who's interested in being on there, that will be the committee. I don't think we need, do we, need, we don't need to take any action. That's an, just an appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there is a, just so, um, not, I forget what, call, not confirmation, but it's concurrence of the, of the um, RTC. So would that. that be a motion? So that would be a, a motion. Move that we accept yes. the committee proposed by John Leopold. Second. Motion by uh, Rockin, seconded by Brown. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next we'll move on to item number 16, which is the director's report. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Dondero. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. A um, few items to uh, share with you this morning. Um, first item uh, is regarding a um, economic uh, study that just came out this week um, regarding the key economic impacts of Senate Bill 1. Um, this was uh, uh, authored by the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. I won't read all of this information, but uh, one of the th key items here is that uh, with Senate Bill 1, uh, it's creating an average of 68,000 jobs per year for 10 years that will yield 3.3 billion in salaries for California workers each year. So, and then there's some other items there that you can read. Um, and there's a link in here, um, and we can send you that as well, um, but it's uh, to get the full report, it runs about 60 pages if you're interested in getting a, a, a copy or uh, contact us and we'll, we'll get one to you. Um, on February 20th, I attended Self-Help County's coalition meeting in Sacramento. Um, there, our executive director, Keith Dunn, did a great job of um, running the meeting, getting us through various business and legislative items. Um, I'm, I'm just, I just sort of cherry picked, these are just sort of random things from my notes, they're not necessarily um, connected, but um, just to give you a sense of what the meeting was about. Uh, the coalition uh, has not had a dues change since 1992, um, and uh, actually the annual conference provides most of the revenue that's needed to run the organization. Only about 20% of it comes from our dues. Um, the 2018 conference will be in October in Riverside. Um, we talked a bit about the coalition's good relationship with the California Transportation Commission, um, and they had held a town hall meeting with the CTC last year, and the CTC's expressed interest in um, doing another one this year, which is a good sign. It keeps the uh, communication channels open with some of the key de decision makers at the state level. Um, as we approach the um, uh, um, November elections, um, the fact that we'll be changing governors is, always has an impact on uh, uh, high-level uh, positions in the state government. In transportation, uh, Transportation Secretary Brian Kelly has um, already left, and uh, Caltrans Director Malcolm Doherty has also left his post, so we'll probably see a few more of those announcements. It's just. It happens every six years, so. <laughs> um, there was a lot of discussion about the current effort to repeal Senate Bill 1, um, and uh, the study that I previously mentioned, the economic impact study, the coalition, um, uh, the executive directors, including myself, uh, voted unanimously to contribute $50,000 towards the cost of that study. Uh, that money comes from a reserve that accumulates um, from the conferences, so it does not come out of our dues money. Um, <coughs> other organizations that are working to stop the repeal of Senate Bill 1 include uh, CSAC, uh, it's the State Association of Counties, uh, the League of Cities, and CalCOG, to name a few. Um, current efforts um, are really focused on the support of Proposition 69, uh, which has a strong message of protecting the revenues generated under SB1 from being used for other than transportation per uses, um, and thereby building trust, transparency, and accountability with the voters. So um, that's sort of the first step that will be on the June ballot, Prop 69, um, and that will uh, put a firewall basically between um, those revenues and um, any other uses. So um, we have several um, staffing items today. The first one is that uh, Daniel Nakuna, our chief financial officer, has passed the 25-year mark uh, for years of service uh, to the RTC. Um, Daniel's expertise in all things fiscal has kept the wheels turning and the audits admirable uh, at the RTC over the years. And we have a resolution here which I would like to read and which we would hope you would approve. 
Um, <clears throat> Whereas Fiscal Officer Daniel Nakuna began his career with the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission on January 19, 1993. Whereas Mr. Nakuna has provided 25 years of dedicated and professional service to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and has demonstrated exemplary commitment to the Santa Cruz County community. Whereas during his 25 year tenure, Mr. Nakuna helped to establish the Regional Transportation Commission as a separate functional entity within the Santa Cruz County government structure after the RTC moved out of the Santa Cruz County Planning Department in 1992 and helped to establish the RTC as a completely separate agency after the RTC became autonomous from the county government structure in 2006 all the while ensuring that the RTC's fiscal processes and procedures secured sound audits. And I can personally attest to that. His audits have, I mean, they're just, we all sleep better at night because Daniel, <laughs> Daniel produces good audits. Whereas Mr. Nakuna has served the RTC and Santa Cruz County community with unassuming distinction, and whereas the commission and staff of the RTC would like to express their deep gratitude and appreciation to Mr. Nakuna for his years of service and commitment to the Regional Transportation Commission and the Santa Cruz County community. Therefore, be it resolved by the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission that in recognition of his many years of public service, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission does hereby commend and I never learned how to pronounce your name correctly, Daniel. His, his, his native name is N-Z-U-Z-I. Could you print? Just rolls off the tongue. Zuzi. Okay. Zuzi. Daniel, um, obviously, is his um, taken American name, uh, for his efforts in advancing transportation in Santa Cruz County and expresses sincere appreciation on behalf of itself, RTC <coughs> staff, and all citizens of Santa Cruz County. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be happy to take a motion on this resolution. We actually approve this resolution. Uh, <laughs> motion by Rock and seconded by uh, Chase. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Uh, carries unanimously. You, 25 years gives you a chance to speak at the microphone. Uh, if there's a, <laughs> we've kept you pretty quiet for 25 years, Daniel. And this is your chance. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm really so happy to and honored to get uh, my 25-year resolution. Uh, my life has been an uh, interesting journey <laughs> from a tiny little village in Congo, Africa, to here in Santa Cruz, uh, life cannot get any better than this. Um, I would like to thank George for your kind words, and uh, also the past uh, uh, executive directors who brought me on board. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, people I worked with, uh, Caltrain District 5, uh, the folks at the county, especially the auditor's office, um, we have also, I have, I also worked with people at the Metro. Uh, finally, but not least, uh, my colleague uh, on staff um, has been just uh, a great team. And uh, I'm happy to be a member of the, that team. Um, I like my job and uh, it was a pleasure. It has been a pleasure uh, serving the community in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. A good financial person is someone you never hear about uh, at these meetings, and uh, it's nice to recognize you for your 25 years of service. I've known you, I think, almost that whole, whole time um, uh, because uh, uh, my wife I used to work at the RTC probably 25 <laughs> years ago, so I remember when Daniel came on board. Um, anything else, Mr. Dunder? Well, we have a couple more. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Shannon Munns. Uh, I'm proud to introduce Shannon Munns as the new RTC communication specialist. Shannon resides in Capitola and says her commute is much better now as she no longer has to make the daily drive to Stanford University. 
Um, Shannon has over 11 years experience in public relations, strategic media cultivations, and editorial expertise. Her previous employers include Stanford University, City of Palo Alto, AOLpatch.com, Commonwealth Club of California, and Media News in Los Gatos. She has a BA degree in journalism from San Francisco State University, and her strengths include journalistic writing, public relations, marketing, creative problem solving, and project management. And I'm sure we're gonna need all those skills in the future, Shannon, so welcome aboard. Would you like to? Shannon is behind the scenes, so she's not gonna, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from you in 25 years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah start writing now. Yeah, write that down. Uh, so, fi final item in my report. Um, next month will mark my 12th year of service <coughs> to the commission, uh, while we're counting years here, I guess. Uh, rumors have been circulating about my pending retirement. Uh, today, I can confirm that there is some truth to these rumors. My exit will take place by the end of this calendar year. It has been a real privilege and honor to serve this community and to work with so many highly accomplished and professional staff and with a board that works diligently for the greater good of all members of the community. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dondero, and uh, there will be plenty of time over this next year to recognize the, uh, the many accomplishments that you've had uh, and you've helped lead the RTC uh, over these last 12 years. I want to express my appreciation for that work, that leadership, that consensus building, which has been really important, uh, most notably on the passage of Measure D. Um, you, you came uh, right after the defeat of the previous sales tax measure, and you were given a charge to, to pass one, yes. and uh, no one thought it could be done, and because of the hard work that you put in with the staff, with this commission, and with the community, we were successful, and, I, and we'll always be grateful for that. So uh, I look forward to the many ways in which we recognize your service over this next year. Thank you. Um, so now we'll uh, continue on with the meeting after that, the, uh, that uh, important uh, news. Uh, recognizing service, recognizing new employees, and, and, and getting important information. Uh, number 17 is the Caltrans report. Good morning, Ms. Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Well, along those lines, I'd also like to state that uh, Caltrans is also going through a change in leadership. Director Malcolm Dougherty is leaving Caltrans after his 26 years career with Caltrans and seven years as the director. Tomorrow uh, is his last day and effective March 3rd, uh, the appointee, the director appointee is Lori Berman. She comes into the position from now, uh, she is the chief deputy. She has most recently been the district director of our District 11 office in San Diego. She has approximately 34 years of experience with Caltrans and is highly regarded and as a um, well-rounded professional. She, uh, she'll do a great job leading the department. And then taking her chief deputy position uh, is, will be Ryan Chamberlain. He is currently the district director of District 12, which is in Orange County. He also has a f diverse career with Caltrans, has been uh, with the department for about 20 years, has had positions in headquarters, including uh, the chief of the Division of Transportation Planning, uh, and uh, has worked in a number of functions over the years. So there will be a new team at the helm, uh, and they're eager and ready to carry on the momentum uh, that Malcolm and, and his team created um, and, w and excited to shepherd in this new era under SB1. I would like to highlight the uh, information that was provided in your packet regarding the SHOP program. As, as you're becoming familiar with, we produce this information two times per year in, um, in tandem with the monthly update that you see that's um, produced with your agenda packet each month. The larger packet is what we, I would consider to be the most comprehensive listing of shop funded projects uh, in the county. We select from those to report monthly based on your level of interest and, um, and need to coordinate activities. If there's something on this longer list you don't see on the monthly list, please let us know. We're happy to report on those. We like to manage the, the information so that we're not over 
um, over communicating on lots of details, but we want to make sure that you are informed and that you know um, how we are um, taking care of the system and uh, working to um, maintain and catch up on much of the deferred maintenance that now SB1 will allow us to, to do more of. Lastly, I would just like to point to a letter that was handed out in your dais. I'm sorry it did not get into your packet on time. It's a letter dated February 27th, signed out by our district director, Tim Gubbins, and it addresses uh, comments and questions that were raised at prior board meetings. So, uh, mostly specific in regard to 152 and one question on State Park Road, which we're still looking into. Okay. Any questions? Are there questions for Ms. Lowe? Mr. Caput. Yeah, I want to. I want to thank you for uh, your office uh, taking the time. Uh, you know, getting back on different requests. I know you must get a lot of them because your district goes from what Paso Robles all the way up to Santa Clara County, right? Uh, our office includes Santa Barbara County and carries on up to uh, Hollister and San Benito County as right. well. And uh, so anyway, I, I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, uh, actually responding and trying to make something work. And uh, as a reward for that, I'm going to have another list of uh, requests <laughs> to give to you in your office. I, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I think uh, what we're looking at here is uh, uh, near that intersection where a, uh, a woman actually died uh, about six months ago. Uh, she was in the crosswalk, but the speed limit was a pretty high coming up to that crosswalk. Uh, it actually had a light there too, but I think uh, better signage in that area is a step forward. And, uh, and also your concerns about uh, uh, crosswalks on Main Street, which are part of Highway 152. Uh, uh, we, we actually uh, fixed some of the uh, visual part, making it easier to see people that were standing at the crosswalk getting ready to go across. Uh, the other would be uh, a roundabout uh, that's on the, uh, the s schedule for t uh, 2020. <coughs> are there many roundabouts on actual freeways? I, I mean, I, I like the idea. I think it's worth a ch worth a chance and everything, but I it's I find it very unique that uh, you're responding to the problem that we do have out there. It's near the fairgrounds. Uh, Commissioner Capito, are you referring to the Highway 129 Lakeview intersection? Yes, I believe uh, Carlton, the one right below it, I believe, or whatever. At Carlton Road, we're constructing a, a left turn channelization. Okay, and there's, uh, will that be a roundabout on the, uh, the Lakeview one? Yes. That's gonna help a lot, uh, and I really appreciate your looking at that. Okay. Uh, because it is, both of those uh, intersections are very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that, we appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, I had one question. Uh, this morning uh, we woke up to hear the news about the Board of Equalization not increasing the gas tax. Uh, by four cents, um, uh, and I'm wondering what effect that will have on any of these projects or um, or, or Caltrans related activity. Are you from uh, com you Commissioner that? Leopold? I'm not familiar with that, so I'll have to get some information, get back to you on that. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd appreciate that. The um, then the 2010 gas tax swap. The Board of Equalization was given the authority to approve uh, gas tax increases. Um, this would be the last time that they would be able to do it before it's taken away because the Board of Equalization is changing. Um, and uh, uh, they, they voted down the increase in the gas tax. So we, it's fortunate that we have SB1, but you know every little bit helps. Okay. Uh, Next, we'll move on to item 18, which is uh, Senate Bill 1, updates and position. Um, looks like uh, Ms. Marconi uh, is uh, our speaker. Good morning, commissioners. I was rapidly trying to email our legislative assistant in Sacramento to find out about the BOE information <laughs> for you. <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, 
and I probably won't in the next 15 minutes, but I um, will talk about the things I do know about, which are um, Senate Bill 1, and um, as the commission knows, um, since last April when the state legislature and the governor approved Senate Bill 1, the um, Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, we have discussed this bill and, and what it means for our community as well as the entire state several times. Com uh, Director Dondero also referenced this earlier in his director's report, and at your legislative at your um, board meeting last month you approved the 2018 legislative platform which includes and has included for several years um, identifying as priorities for this board to make sure that we are maintaining transportation funds where they are in existence, making sure that they're not diverted to other uses. Um, we've had this problem over the last decade, especially where some state transportation funds have been used for non-transportation purposes or to repay bond debt service that was expected to be repaid through um, general funds. Um, and we've also advocated for more funding in recognition that our county, just on the local street and road system, has over a $300 million backlog of needs in order to get our roads in good condition. Um, and so we were all welcoming Senate Bill 1 when it came to fruition last April. It took a lot of negotiations and conversations at the state level, um, coordination with local agencies, Caltrans, partners throughout the state to, to bring this bill to fruition. Um, the California State Association of Counties, the League of Cities, so many partners participated in, in making sure that bill went into effect. Um, and many of us were concerned and, and reluctant and because of the history of some transportation funds being diverted. Um, and because of that, the legislature, in addition to approving Senate Bill 1, um, uh, approved a sister bill called um, ACA 5, Assembly Constitutional Amendment 5, which was to firewall the funds. That is now on the June ballot as a constitutional amendment that voters will consider as Proposition 69. And um, so today we are recommending that the board take an official position on Proposition 69, recognizing our support for ensuring that transportation dollars remain dedicated for transportation purposes. Um, just as a, as a reminder, Senate Bill 1 is the first significant stable investment in transportation since the mid-1990s. It's a long time coming. And as our vehicles become more fuel efficient, which is outstanding in many ways, it doesn't reduce how much we're using our road system, how much we're wanting to use our transit system, our bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And so there's been this vacuum of funding needs and so finally um, Senate Bill 1 is helping us to address at least some of the deferred maintenance that exists. Um, in Santa Cruz County, um, Senate Bill 1 is expected to bring about $10 million a year of formula funds as well as about $10 million a year um, through the State Highway Operations and Protection Program to address safety and maintenance needs on our state highway system. Additionally, we're going to be able to compete for over a billion dollars a year in um, transportation funds for um, transit projects, rail projects, highway projects, um, local bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, so far since Senate Bill 1 was approved, um, the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz have received $1.5 million through the Active Transportation Program for safety projects on San Lorenzo River and um, near Watsonville High School. So we're already seeing these funds come to our county. Um, for the cities, there's in the county, um, it's bringing in about $7 million a year for um, local street and road operations and maintenance projects filling potholes, but our local jurisdictions are also using those funds on bicycle and pedestrian projects as well. And um, within the staff report, there's an attachment that shows the list of projects that local jurisdictions have approved at their board meetings. It's a very transparent public process um, on how they intend to use those Senate Bill 1 funds. Again, at the state level, the California Transportation Commission has discretion over a lot of these funds, and they have established a lot of um, safety guards to make sure that everyone's accountable on how these funds are used, that they're put um, on projects that have been selected through community processes. Um, and so we're, I feel like it's a really strong <laughs> bill and, and should be protected. Unfortunately, some people in the state are reluctant. Um, you know, we're all concerned with having to pay more at the gas pump or um, through our vehicle registration fees, but there's just been such a huge backlog and underfunding with the gas tax not having been indexed since the mid-1990s, that um, Senate Bill 1 is really, as gas prices fluctuate, you know, 20 cents within a month, this um, small increase is, is really not um, 
over the whole year, not a huge impact on folks. And so we are recommending that we oppose efforts to repeal this. This includes Assembly Bill 1756 um, by Republican Burrow. Um, it's unlikely to move through the legislature, but again, it's, it's good for us to just go on record as opposing any efforts to repeal. There's also been an a, uh, initiative um, that has been circulated. It is most likely going to be on the November 2018 ballot to repeal the um, Senate Bill 1 revenues and require that any future taxes or fees go through a, a vote of the electorate, which um, really impacts our ability to address transportation needs on an ongoing basis and just recognize um, when inflation has happened and that um, costs do go up. So we are joining the um, Fix Our Roads Coalition, which is made up our, of the California um, Council of Governments, which we're a member of, as well as the California State Association of Counties, the League of Cities, the California Transit Associations, um, business groups throughout the state, including the Santa Cruz Area Chamber, who and our local jurisdictions who have, um, several of our local jurisdictions who have already taken positions or will be considering positions to support um, Proposition 69 and oppose repeal efforts of Senate Bill 1. So um, in your packet, there is a resolution that we we do recommend you go officially on record taking those positions. Um, I also just wanted to highlight that even with Senate Bill 1, there still remains a, a, a backlog of transportation needs in our community and that um, gasoline taxes are not sustainable, especially as we convert to an all electric um, or more electric vehicle fleet or more hybrid vehicles. And so um, we also continue to support efforts to look at other alternative options to the gasoline tax. Um, the state's been doing analysis of, you know, would a vehicle mile per fee make more sense or what, uh, you know, vehicle registration fees, what are all the different options? And so we continue to support those efforts. And then on the federal level, we are monitoring um, proposals both from President Trump as well as congressional members on um, ways to address the fact that the federal gasoline tax hasn't been raised since the mid-1990s either. And so. Um, we continue to monitor that and support efforts at the federal level, which will ensure that more funding comes back to address our transportation needs here in Santa Cruz County. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. But again, my staff recommendation is for the commission to approve the resolution that support takes a position to support Proposition 69 and oppose efforts to repeal this new funding. Thank you for the report. Are there questions? <coughs> Oh, all right, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Rachel, um, after the commission considers this action and assume that the commission approves it as our legislative platform, do you coordinate with all the other jurisdictions in the county to communicate with them? Because all the county, of course, and the cities all have legislative platforms mm -hmm. and they all have lobbyists. So you, you let them know what we've approved and, and encourage them to Yes, and already um, Santa Cruz Metro and the city of Santa Cruz have already taken posi these positions. Um, Watsonville and Scotts Valley will be considering it, I believe, at their March meetings. Right. Um, we've shared uh, sample resolutions. They are also hearing from League of Cities and the California State Association of Counties as well. And um, so we, we, we discuss this at our, our agency technical advisory committee meetings as well. Yeah, so, great. Yes. So one last question. Um, so sometimes the League of Cities and CSAC isn't, aren't aligned. They are on this one. Absolutely. Okay, okay great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Herbst. Uh, just to comment, if I might, I, I just want to say the city of Watsonville is very appreciative of the additional resources that we've received and the essentialness of, uh, of maintaining highways and, and roadways and streets and sidewalks and bike paths. And, and this enables us to have a, a much better and, and safer city. And so I want to thank you. And I also want to thank Caltrans for their focus on uh, the three uh, state highways that bisect Watsonville as well. Thank you for your service. All right, well now I'll see if there's members of the public who want to address us about the SB1 repeal. Uh, seeing none, I would- uh, Move approval. Second. Motion by community, <coughs> seconded by Rockin. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, motion carries unanimously and we'll be ready to fight for this one uh, 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 come the fall. Yeah, and just to clarify, we're not telling others how to vote. We are just taking a position of support. Just wanted to clarify that. Um. <laughs> well, then we'll move on to item number 19, which is state funding updates. <laughs> um, 
so next up is the state transport. I wanted to talk a little bit and give you an update on the state transportation improvement program. As the commission may recall, you are responsible for selecting projects to receive these state funds, which um, because of Senate Bill 1, the state transportation improvement program has stability for the first time in as long as I can remember. Um, because it's replacing that fluctuating gasoline tax with a per gallon fee. Um, in the past, the gasoline tax has fluctuated, that goes into the STIP has fluctuated from nine cents a gallon to 22 cents a gallon, and now it's set at 17 cents a gallon um, based on inflation rates. Um, so the California Transportation Commission estimates that over the next five years, there's gonna be $17.5 million available for projects in Santa Cruz County. Um, our board selected projects following a public hearing in December for those funds. We also um, switched around some funds for um, that were previously approved for uh, projects that were approved for regional surface transportation program funds that are a little more flexible than STIP funds with STIP funds to focus these STIP funds on some of our larger projects in our county. Um, and, but knowing that any decision of this board is subject to concurrence by the CTC in December, we also approved some best case, mid case, and worst case scenarios where what if the CTC didn't approve all of the STIP funding requests that we proposed? Well, I have really good news. Last night, the CTC staff released their staff recommendations for the 2018 STIP, and they match up with their preliminary staff recommendations in that for the first time in at least 15 years, they are recommending every single project that we have proposed to be included in the STIP. So this is really a good thing. Um, we're really excited. Actually, Metro had three projects in there. They were willing to postpone one of them if there wasn't enough money in 1819. The CTC staff recommendations, which I haven't even told Metro staff yet, are to include all three projects in fiscal year 1819. So this is really exciting. We're gonna be able to accelerate a lot of um, transportation projects that have been on the list for a while. Um, so I just wanted to provide you an update on that and let you know what I think is really good news. It's very uncommon that the commission, the CTC would not approve its own staff recommendations. And so um, I expect as of March 21st, we'll be able to give the green light to everyone to start implementing their projects quickly. So that's really uh, You great. missed uh, Mr. Clifford's uh, broad smile Yay. that, uh, <laughs> that broke out upon the news of that. <laughs> Uh, are there questions or comments from uh, members of the commission? Uh, Mr. Caput. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this actually quick. Uh, uh, we've requested, I guess, uh, that a grant for Houlihan and... Uh, Highway 152. Uh, Highway 152. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I think we're actually going forward and it looks very good. I hate to say that, knock on wood, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so another project that the commission did approve funds for back in December, there was about $700,000, $800,000 from our regional surface transportation program funds, but we're also seeking a competitive grant th that's provided through Senate Bill 1 from the local partnership program. We're able to compete for those funds only because we have Measure D in our county. We wouldn't even be able to submit an application if we didn't have Measure D. Um, so yes, we've been working with um, Commissioner Caput's staff as well as CTC staff to really advocate that we're able to get the final million and a half that's needed for that project through that competitive program. We will know the results and what the CTC staff recommendations are in, um, what their recommendations are in April with um, CTC board action in May. So we're still on hold to know if, if it actually does get funded, but I really appreciate the work that your staff has done to collect support letters and reach out to the California Transportation Commission. So hopefully that will get fully funded. Well, thank you also. And I, I believe uh, it was rated very high on, uh, uh, in, on the request list. It meets a lot of the criteria for the local partnership really program. Good. I think it's a very good candidate. Thank you. That said, I can't guarantee because LA County requested a billion dollars. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> uh, other uh, comments or questions? I'll, I'll just say that um, you know it, 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 it makes a difference to have resources to take care of our, our transportation infrastructure, and this is a good sign uh, with the passage of SB1 that we actually have resources to take care of many different things. You know, when we came up with our regional transportation plan and look out about what our needs are and the, the gulf between what we have and what we need, mm -hmm. it's still great. So the uh, SB1 really provides a tremendous amount of money and, and um, it's great to see the CDC agreeing to all of our um, requests and thank you for your work on that. 
Okay. Uh, now I'll see if there's any member of the public who'd like to address us about this item. Uh, seeing none, it's not really an action item. We no, don't require any action, report. the nope. status report. So thank you for the report. If they had said they didn't want to recommend any of our things, then I wanted to have this on the agenda in case I needed some last minute action <laughs> from you, all of you. Well, the world has changed a little bit. So you can, <clears throat> you can sit day. down and figure out what happened with the Board of Equalization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll move on to item 20, which is the early mitigation for transportation improvements in Santa Cruz County, the MOU approval, Mr. Dondero. Uh, yes, good morning again, commissioners. Um, keeping in our theme with the long view um, of transportation, um, this is an item that was um, actually brought to you uh, back in 2009 or 10, I believe. Um, and we were, the, uh, we were the first agency to actually approve this MOU, but since then, um, it went through some gyrations and it, uh, some of the wording changed, and I don't, think any of you except maybe Mr. Johnson was on the commission at that time. Is that well, Don't rub it in. And, and I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> if it was nine or 10, I was here. Oh, maybe you were, okay. Yeah. So we had two, I, I two commissioners here, here and, and Mr. Rockin. So at any rate, um, it, it, uh, to, to explain briefly what this is, is that um, anytime uh, we do, do a construction project in transportation, uh, part of the environmental process is to identify any impacts on the environment, and that can sometimes mean uh, <coughs> removal of trees or taking of some wetlands or impacting, um, you know, a variety of things that include, you know, <coughs> natural features. <coughs> and so uh, I, I, the mitigation that has to be done has to be locked in, funded, and all the agreements have to be signed uh, for that mitigation project before the actual construction project can go forward. And we went through that uh, fire drill when we built the um, auxiliary lane project on Highway 1 a few years ago, and we were, we were frantic to get this mitigation project in place because um, the clock was ticking uh, to get the construction uh, contract signed. Uh, uh, otherwise, we were going to lose the state bond money from the CTC. So it can be a real critical part of a project, but it's a hidden part that most of us don't really notice most of the time. And so this grew out of an effort um, that goes back to the early 2000s um, in Monterey County. Uh, Elkhorn Slough, which I'm, many of you are familiar with, um, uh, an MOU was, was uh, signed around preserving uh, um, much of the, the property there and some of the sensitive habitats. And, uh, and sort of actually banking some of this land for future use as mitigation uh, for future transportation projects. And it was done through a very collaborative process and Caltrans was, was one of the major players in this and so was the Resource Conservation District. And so after that was signed, um, the RCD came to us and said, we think this model could work in Santa Cruz County. In fact, we think it could work in a lot of places. And actually, their vision was, was um, uh, preemptive of uh, actual trend right now statewide amongst Caltrans uh, and at the federal level to do exactly what this MOU is saying. So in a sense, we're, we, we were predicting the future and, and now we're catching up with the current state of affairs. Um, it's a great model because <laughs> what it does is it, it builds um, trust between agencies that traditionally don't always work that well together. If you look at the attachment, <coughs> excuse me, um, there's 13 agencies that are signing on to this, and that's what's caused the delay in getting this agreement signed. My colleague from the Resource Conservation District, uh, Chris Coburn, is here today, and um, I'd, I'd like to ask Chris to step up and just say a few words because he has been a prime mover in, in getting this, um, this document through the uh, approval process of all 13 of these agencies. When I say 13, that includes their legal departments. And uh, that was quite often, I think, the sticking point. <laughs> so, Chris, why don't you share a little bit of your perspective on this? Thanks, George. And I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak to this briefly today. And I would like to take credit for the, uh, the foresight for this initiative. Uh, unfortunately, I'd have to give that credit to, not fortunately, but uh, Karen Christensen with the RCD really worked with George initially in envisioning this new type of partnership 
for the way in which natural resources can be protected and the way in which natural resource agencies can be working with transportation agencies. Because really what we're talking about are public values and public resources. Even though we might, might not be talking about fish or frogs necessarily, when we're talking about transportation projects, those are public resources that need to be considered as well too. And so when the public is investing and investing significantly in these projects, it doesn't make sense for them to get held up by mitigation requirements and other complications with projects. George stole my, a little bit of my thunder with respect to the, <laughs> the auxiliary lane project because that was the prime example for this partnership where the RCD and a lot of these agencies listed in the document partnered with the RTC to find a mitigation opportunity that satisfied the needs uh, for the transportation projects but also really restored and protected a significant resource down in, in Watsonville in terms of water quality and other habitat. And that's really the model that we're working on here is how do we more effectively implement transportation projects while protecting natural resources. So as George mentioned, this has been a long time in coming. We, you know, you announced your retirement today, so I'm glad we got it in before, <laughs> before then. <laughs> I wasn't so sure for a while. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, when you do interact with a number of attorney, uh, the attorneys and legal departments that are involved with these agencies, it does get a little bit tricky. Uh, but we've made it through. And, um, you know, it's just, I think this is a really unique opportunity in Santa Cruz County. It's a biodiversity hotspot. We have tremendous natural resources protecting those resources and hoping to enhance those. We've developed programs like the Integrated Watershed Restoration Program, which has protect or implemented over 150 restoration projects over the last decade in Santa Cruz County. So we're talking stream restoration, dam removal, uh, amphibian pond creation, erosion control, all types of projects that are protecting our natural environment. We have a document uh, pr uh, produced by the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, the <coughs> Conservation Blueprint, which really provides us, no pun intended, but a roadmap for how and where we should be protecting natural resources in the county. And I see this MOU as another piece in the puzzle to help us really more effectively mitigate for those transportation related impacts. Um, so I just wanted to, again, thank the, the commission for consideration of moving into this type of model. I think, uh, as George mentioned, the Manave or the, the uh, wetlands project down in Watsonville for the auxiliary lanes, we're also working, uh, not directly related to this, but uh, with the county, with the RTC, the Coastal Conservancy, the coast, well, all the signatories here as well as Caltrans on a project up on Scotts Creek where it really sort of exemplifies this new approach to transportation planning where we're looking at how do we restore the lagoon and marsh ecosystem there at Scotts Creek, which has been so heavily impacted by the bridge that was put in place there in the 1950s, 1960s, I can't remember the date. But we're looking at it as a lagoon and marsh restoration project. NOAA Fisheries has highlighted that project as the most important project for recovery of coho on the central coast of California. And so we're looking at that, that project as restoration. Oh, by the way, it's also going to have a transportation related improvement. We're going to hopefully replace the bridge there and improve safety on the transportation corridor through there, improve public access and restore the system. And so these types of things I hope we'll see more of. Um, you know, it's it, MOU helps us get there and, and I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the effort that we've all put into uh, Persevere, I guess, is yeah. what I'm trying to say all these years. Yeah. So, thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you for your work. Progress. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll see if there's any questions from members of the commission. <coughs> Seeing none, I'll see if there's any comments from members of the public. Uh, Marilyn Guerra, retired teacher from Pajaro Valley Schools, and many times I took my classroom children on a field trip to the Elkhorn Slough, wonderful place. And um, I, I hope this memorandum of understanding, I haven't read through it in detail, but it actually does protect and restore the natural resources because, and then I have a question at the end of my comment, because over the years, of course, transportation projects and freeways destroy 
the natural environment and communities. And one of the things I and others tried to do some years ago when Ellen Peary and Mark Stone were on the board of supervisors, Marty Wormhout too, I think, at that time. Uh, Ellen Peary and Mark Stone together uh, uh, got together and had um, a change in policy to stop roadside spraying of Roundup in the, on the county roads. It used to just be a blight area. And we tried to get Caltrans included, as in, I think, Mendocino and Humboldt County, where they stopped this destructive uh, to the environment, to wildlife. It, um, I think, Roundup's categorized as a carcinogen now. So a major way to restore and protect the natural resources as much as possible, because I think it might be kind of an oxymoron where you have highways and transportation and protecting resources. My question is, are you still spraying uh, Roundup on, on the roads or for anything? Because, of course, the mechanical means of cutting um, and non-toxic methods of weed control should be used, not toxic herbicides. So that's what I wanna know, and I wanna add one thing. When I was at the bus stop today at Redwood Heights Road and Freedom Boulevard, it looked to me like um, just a little bit of grass around the bus stop looked like that had been sprayed. I'd like to know um, what that was, because of course it goes into the water system, we're breathing it. Uh, I'd like to see a non-toxic world, wouldn't you? Thank you. Okay, would anybody like to else like to provide testimony about the MOU? Yeah. Um, uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, Mr. Hurst. I think it's quite an accomplishment uh, to involve this many agencies and the, in the you know, it's uh, trying to get agreement uh, and establish uh, these kind of partnerships is phenomenal. And so I say thank you to the Resource Conservation District and uh, this body and every other body who has uh, signed on to this. It's monumental. So Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, George. And let's thank Karen, too. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I just want to, I'll move approval because this is a really exciting effort and I want to thank uh, Chris for this effort and then for mentioning uh, the potential restoration of Scott Creek, which would be an amazing opportunity and it's only going to happen with this kind of collaboration across many different agencies. Uh, yeah. So there's a motion by Coonerty, seconded by Chase. To I'll just say thank Mr. you. Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I Realize that it also involved Monterey County, Santa Cruz County cooperation on both of it. And the, uh, a lot of the, the dirt that's being used uh, came from the uh, sediment removal from the Pajaro River uh, project about three years ago. So it's good to see that actual soil going to a place where it's, actually, where it's gonna help uh, the habitat. Thank you. Ms. Brown. I just want to make a brief comment. Um, first, thank you for all the work that you've done, and it is exciting to think about uh, all of these agencies actually cooperating and, and communicating and um, managing the process of um, offsite compensation mitigation, early mitigation efforts. Um, I'm not a big fan of um, offsite compensation, as we know. Um, I think it's pretty clear that valuation of ecosystem services is tricky. It's pretty subjective most of the time. Um, and so I, I, I feel, I have mixed feelings about it, but I do appreciate the effort to um, make this work. And given that um, the courts have deemed offsite compensation appropriate and legal, I think this is absolutely the best case scenario for um, ensuring the most sustainable um, process moving forward. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Bertrand. When we lived in Boulder Creek, our, um, our house and property got flooded. It took us two and a half years to get all the permissions, and that involved uh, the feds, the state, and the county. Um, the actual project to do the mitigation took three months. 
to get the approvals took over two years. So this is an immense, immense accomplishment. Uh, seeing no one else, I would just say that it's a good example of, uh, it takes a lot of work to, to work together, but collaboration is usually a better strategy than confrontation, and um, this will really help us on these projects uh, as we seek to build them. Uh, there's been a motion by, uh, by uh, Mr. Coonerty and seconded by Ms. Chase. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And with that, we get to the <coughs> uh, last item, which is review of items to be discussed in closed session. Mr. Mendez. Yes, uh, we're just going to have one item under the uh, closed session uh, this morning. It'll be the uh, conference real property uh, uh, negotiator for uh, you know, pursuant to government code section 54956.8, the property in question, Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, and the agent negotiators are George Sandero, Luis uh, Mendez, and the first negotiation are the RTC and Progressive Rail. Their negotiations is price and terms. The uh, uh, labor uh, negotiations item will not be needed this morning. Okay. And we don't expect that there'll be anything to report. <coughs> there'll, be no, there'll be no report out of closed session. Um, this is an opportunity for anybody to discuss anything uh, that's on the closed session agenda. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, um, you know, I've received a number of emails with respect to uh, Progressive Rail and the negotiations that are going on. And I think people want reassurances that because everything else is waiting for the corridor study, that any sort of agreement that would happen would happen after that that uh, study is completed. So could you just speak a little bit about that so you can kind of reassure people that, you know, there's no closed door um, agreements that are going to be signed? This, this is a real estate negotiation, which has to be, you have to do that not in the public eye before you actually take the action. No, I realize that. I'm just talking more or less about the, the timing. This is actually what we would like to talk to you about okay. in closed session. All right. And it was the, uh, the, the, the direction of the commission to enter into these negotiations, yes. but uh, make a long-term commitment. So, yeah. um, uh, so if there is anyone else who would like to address us, um, seeing none, we will uh, move to closed session. Oh, no, no, no. oh, yeah, public members. Members of the public. Oh, I thought, I thought that's why uh, I apologize. About that. I apologize. <laughs> um, hi, Gail McNulty. Again, speaking more as an individual than representing Greenway on this particular topic. Um, the fact that RTC staff endorsed a 10 to 20 year tourist train contract at the January 18th meeting sent a pretty strong signal that their goal is to keep the tracks in place no matter what. This does not bode well for the fairness of the Unified Corridor Study, which is currently considering non-rail options for people who are desperate, or for people who are desperately looking for alternatives to gridlock. A tourist train with tickets that would likely be $30 to $50 per person, per Craig McKenzie, of the CEO of Progressive Rail, may bring a bit of tourist money to our county, but it would not help to reduce gridlock, and it is no way an equitable solution. I want to thank the commissioners for rec recognizing that entering into a tourist train, um, the tourist train portion of this contract prior to the end of the Unified Corridor Study would not be fair. I also want to thank Commissioners Bertrand, McPherson, and Johnson for voting against entering negotiations in January when things were moving very quickly. Since January, the public has learned a lot of new information. We've learned about Progressive Rail's business practices in Wisconsin and Minnesota. I've personally spoken to people in these communities um, where Progressive Rail is currently operating, and I am personally incredibly afraid of the idea of bringing them to our, our county and signing a contract with them. Um, we've learned about Progressive Rail's very strong ties to the oil and gas industry. And we've learned, the public, this is something that perhaps the RTC was aware of, but the public has learned about the Federal Railroad preemption loophole that the oil and gas industry is exploiting to circumvent local zoning and environmental regulations and build massive industrial complexes and establish or continue their other unwanted activity along rail corridors in communities all across the United States. Um, some short line railroads that were losing money 
in past decades, are now finding it extremely profitable to keep running as long as they can figure out a way, any way, to partner with, the oil and, with, a, with an oil and gas firm. As you all know, the oil and gas industry is booming in the United States like never before. The federal government is currently working to encourage offshore drilling and new drilling sites on public land. As a North Coast resident, I wonder about Coast Aries. Who knows? Um, there's a growing demand to ship Bauckham crude out of North Dakota. We've all heard about the pipeline. Well, that they're producing more than they know what to do with. So they can't fit it all into the pipeline. They're sending it out on trains as fast as possible. Our little branch line, our little branch line, is shown as a potential crude oil route on fracktrucker.org. Um, so I have more handouts. I have contact information for people thank in you. Minnesota, and I also have general stuff about what we just, you, what Ms. I just McNulty. mentioned. So thank you. Please come forward if you'd like to address us about uh, items in the closed session. Uh, hello, I'm Ryan Sarnataro, Santa Cruz resident. Um, I wanted to speak about the uh, idea of having some terms in the contract that separate out uh, the rights of the rail operator or uh, the, the rights of progressive to actually block any kind of future solution that might be uh, decided upon through the public and through the, uh, the study that's coming out later this year. I had a little bit of back and forth with Craig McKenzie by email about this, and I suggested that uh, something be put in the contract that, that nothing be in the contract that forces the hand of the county in terms of being required to keep rails in place or, uh, or even uh, fix up the rail corridor for this uh, tourist train until that study is done and until the public has had a chance to actually uh, work with the, uh, the, the possibilities that are out there. I think that it's really important that options remain open until information is in. There's a distinction between uh, what happens on the portion of the corridor that, uh, that could be used for rail, which is the portion into Watsonville, and then the coastal area, which is what could be used for a trail in the future. And so, uh, again, I, I suggested that, uh, that Progressive actually uh, take the lead in making this differentiation in the contract so that um, the county of Santa Cruz would not have the kind of uh, disturbance that it would have if that option is taken off the table now. That's all I'd like to say. Thank Hope you guys go for that. Thank you. Good Thank morning. you. Good morning. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I want to support rail. <laughs> I do. But I want it to be good for the county and I want it to be um, something that really is going to offer an alternative solution for our, our people to get around, in addition to bringing in tourist money. I was at the um, hearing when, uh, the meeting when Progressive, the CEO of Progressive Rail got up, and there were some things that he said that, that bothered me a bit that um, I haven't seen any answers for, and mostly that, you know, he, he wanted to bring in uh, the freight and, and revitalize uh, rail for agricultural use primarily, but, but he said he had already talked with existing rail, uh, freight rail customers, but he didn't specify who that was. Um, it sounds like he's trying to bring in some business for Wattsville, which would be great, but who are those customers? And that's the question I have. Who are they and what do they ship on the rail? What would they warehouse in Watsonville? And w how would that impact um, going from that rail hub if there were truck lines that needed to take it to other areas where there is no rail? How would that impact our, our, our transportation system in the county? Um, I, I, it seems like it's moving very fast and it was only, it seemed like week, uh, 
of short weeks from the time Iowa Pacific announced they were backing out before boom, before you, was Progressive Rail. What I have not been able to figure out either is who's going to be responsible for repairing the tracks that were storm damaged in the San Andreas, the slough areas. Um, so I, I want to side with um, the speakers that I've heard so far. I apologize for coming in late, but I have concerns, but I do support rail, mm -hmm. and I do think there's a space for everybody, rail and trail. Um, I'd like to see the trail get going right now, um, but go, go with caution with the, the rail because of some of these issues that I've raised before you. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. Comments. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Barbara Rutger. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz City, and um, I just want to ask you all, what's the rush in doing this? Um, the unified quarter study has not been concluded yet. You're going into another closed door session and to negoti negotiate the property. Um, I can guarantee you that if the citizens of Santa Cruz knew all the implications that comes with using our rail corridor as a depot for petrochemicals and long-term storage of natural gas and oil stored in parked train cars, they would be up in arms. Yet decisions are going to be made behind closed doors today by you guys. And when people voted on Measure D, I don't think they were thinking about I think they were thinking about alternatives to our transportation system that will reverse greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases and our problem with climate change that's on us now. Forget the debate about the safety of rails moving fracked gas or trucks moving fracked gas. It's about keeping it in the ground. And with this current administration wanting to do offshore drilling, um, approving a plan to use freight cars to store and transport <coughs> oil and gas is just playing into their plan. Um, they just want to go and get every last drop. And this is our time to take bold decisions on which way we're going, and it is a big picture. And I don't think the picture people were thinking of was using our rail corridor, which is right along the water as a parking lot for trains holding oil and gas, and what that all comes with in the big picture. As you know, no, we, we don't really have the funds to run a train. It would inc require new taxes, new grants, federal and state, and that haven't even been approved. So now is the time to wait for the corridor study to come through and bank the rails. It doesn't mean that there'll never be a train, but for our generation right now, we don't have the money and there isn't really a need. It, I'm pretty sure the corridor study is gonna show it's not gonna stop gridlock to have a passenger train running on the rail and just wait for that quarter study to come out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, RTC. How are you doing? Good, good. Excellent. Uh, my name is Drew Glover. I am a city resident here in Santa Cruz. Um, I come just to express some concern. I know that the rail trail is a really controversial topic within our community and our county with regards to what is the best way to go. Um, I have had passionate people from both sides of the argument come and talk to me about their position and what they think should happen. So today I'm gonna talk less about whether there should or should not be a train and talk more about the issues of what the train could be used for as kind of been echoed by, uh, or echoing some of the things we've already heard from people. Uh, the, what's being planned with the tourist train is problematic on many levels uh, and that can be a whole nother conversation. But what I came today to talk about specifically is uh, the idea of freight agreements with progressive rail. So uh, 
there's lots of different community members on both of the different positions that have approached me that are concerned about what's going on, the speed at which go it's happening, and the lack of community input that they feel is being taken into consideration with the construction or the molding of this contract. Uh, and I have to agree that I've had an immense amount of trouble getting information from your offices with regards to your stances on the contract and reassuring me that in the contract negotiations that are taking place, you are taking strong and firm stands to make sure that there is no possibility that the transportation of oil or noxious chemicals through our county will be taking place. Now I know that there's the development of the propane facility in Watsonville, which could be a shadow, a foreshadowing of things to come with regards to what the trail or the rail could be used for. Uh, but I haven't gotten a clear answer from any of the offices, especially because I've only spoken predominantly to your staff. Um, I haven't gotten through to a lot of you individually to be able to talk about your specific positions. Uh, but I haven't gotten any kind of confirmation that you're taking this into consideration or that it is something that you will vehemently oppose if it is included in the negotiations. Um, other things that are kind of concerning is that these conversations are happening behind closed doors now. I'd know that it was mentioned that these are real estate conversations and so there's some legalities of confidentiality. But it just seems from the, com com the comments that have been made from people so far and from my own experiences of trying to get information that there is very little being communicated to the public when they express these concerns or inquire about information. Um, another thing is the time of the meetings. I mean, nine o'clock in the morning is a really hard time for people that are working class to be able to come and voice their opinions about these kinds of situations or stay up to date about what's going on. So you may wanna take into consideration opening up some other public sessions that are broadly broadcast to the community so that they can get involved and get engaged. Um, I haven't taken a stance personally on the rail or the trail, like I mentioned before, because I'm also waiting on a unified corridor study, which a lot of your staff said you're waiting on before you make any official statements as well, even though you're already negotiating this contract. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning. My name is Bill Cook. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, thank you all for your work. Um, it's, I, it's unimaginably hard. I could <laughs> never manage uh, a day in your lives, I don't think. Um, the Surface Transportation Board uh, is uh, an adjudicatory board that uh, uh, succeeded the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission. And uh, to my largely uninformed uh, observation, they, they have a lot to say about what happens in rail corridors. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, the board has wide discretion through its exemption authority from federal, state, and local laws to tailor its regulatory activities to meet the nation's changing transportation needs. I, I'm, not I'm not reassured uh, from that perspective that, that we have any control over uh, the rail corridor. Um, I believe the only uh, thing that, <laughs> I don't see any good things that can come uh, from uh, embracing progressive rail or any other railroad. Rail and oil are um, synonymous. They, they, they're two names for the same entity. They serve each other extremely well uh, in our nation. And um, <clears throat> under the auspices of the Surface Transportation Board, which is not subject to federal, state, or local laws. Uh, I think um, we're exposing ourselves to a lot of problems and a lot of expense unnecessarily. Uh, if we want to control the corridor, I believe that uh, rail banking will not serve that uh, abatement is the only process that, uh, by which we can gain any control over the corridor so that we can use it to our own purposes and our own values. Progressive rail is antithetical to the values of our community. Um, <clears throat> we went to a great deal of work uh, suing oil companies to try to get control over the fracking issue and uh, our exposure. Uh, not to mention the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. Um, this, it's, um, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm at uh, severe pains to understand why we're entertaining this option. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer and a 35 year resident of the city of Santa Cruz. I just want to uh, bring up a couple of points about progressive rail and the pending contract negotiations you're entering into. Uh, freight operations are essential and vital to the economic health of our community. There's a number of um, operators in Watsonville that are taking advantage of this right now. There's a new uh, biofuels facility, Agron, that's coming online. Uh, Agron's gonna be producing, that facility in Watsonville will be producing 15 million gallons per year of biodiesel. Biodiesel has a greenhouse gas footprint of 50% of regular diesel. It's uh, produced from soybean oil, which is a sustainable uh, practice and resource in our, in our community. Um, so they're meeting the needs of that. I'm, I'm impressed with Progressive Rail's idea of, of uh, enhancing freight transfer by building a transloading facility. Uh, either the Coastal Commission, uh, you may have seen their February 5th letter to AMBAG. Uh, the Coastal Commission points out that getting every truck off the road uh, is worth, I mean, every uh, rail car is worth about three trucks on the road. Um, rail is extraordinarily efficient in moving freight and it's safer. It's about number of studies, 15 to 17 times safer than moving by highways. It gets trucks off the road, which preserves capacity for our highways, uh, which have limited capacity, and it's uh, improved safety. So um, we're all for it. <clears throat> as far as the passenger rail, uh, Progressive Rail's uh, proposal for a tourist train is wonderful. It, uh, it is in keeping with the tourist economy of our county. Uh, I don't know where tourism ranks in the county as a, as a revenue producer for the, for the people who live here, but it's gotta be pretty high. So uh, uh, we support that. Uh, I also wanted to point out in the uh, California Coastal Commission uh, letter that preservation of our rail and uh, enhancement, amplification of passenger rail service is in keeping with the sustainable community strategy, which is in place for all of California. So I, I hope you keep those things in mind as you uh, negotiate with Progressive Rail and, and keep in mind that you are currently obligated to provide a, a rail operator for this branch line and you're obligated under the terms under which you accepted the money to buy this rail to uh, provide some kind of passenger rail on the line. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Nancy Connolly. I'm a resident. Hold on, Mark. Uh, my name is Nancy Connolly and I'm a resident uh, city of Santa Cruz. And um, I'm speaking today to ask you our elected officials to slow down with this process. Um, for a commission that I've seen sometimes work at glacial speed on issues, you seem to have reversed um, roles with this one. And you're working with um, a very divisive issue, the issue of the rail. And for someone who really wants to trust my public officials, I'm, I'm struggling with this one because this is a very important issue for our community. Um, and I've seen the issue of agriculture being used as a, in a and a reason for why we need rail. I work in agriculture for a well, very well established company and I know from what I've heard, there is no need for that. And so when you talk, of bring in a whole nother industry, the industry of gas and chemicals, as a member of the board of director of Save Our Shores, that also raises concern for me as it's uh, an environmental issue, and granted there's uh, petrol being moved along our highways, along our rail that needs sufficient improvements, it's a concern. So I do ask that um, 
you be as transparent as possible with the community. I think you owe it to us to be as transparent as possible, to slow down, to keep in mind that uh, Unified Corridor Study is still in the works. Hopefully that is being as unbiased as possible that I just simply ask you to slow down and um, communicate as much as possible with us, your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks to the speakers who've uh, addressed this issue of progressive rail and given some of the history. I learned a great deal I had no idea about. And I'm recalling that Supervisor Leopold, you really led the way on having banning fracking in Santa Cruz County, as I recall, and the idea that progressive way uh, rail potentially with bringing in these toxic materials and involved in various aspects of the fracking process is quite, quite appalling and definitely not in keeping with the values of our community. I also know, uh, you know, being 76 years old and over the years reading about toxic pesticides and spills, that um, we have a precious research of an agricultural area in the Pajaro Valley, as you well know, and to be uh, adding to the mix of a dangerous chemicals and disaster for a major growing area is um, unacceptable. Um, entering into any contract, you know how we hear, look before you leap, a step in, uh, what is it, a stitch in time, say nine. Do not rush into this, examine what has been presented here in terms of the documentation and the potential harm. And I had no idea there were plans for also big development along these rail trails, horrific. Anyway, um, those are my comments. Much appreciation to the speakers here who gave the critique of progressive rail. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Diana Adamick. I'm a city a Santa Cruz resident. And I just want to say I'm not opposed to freight on the tracks. I'm not opposed to passenger rail, but I don't think that all tracks are appropriate for freight and not all tracks are appropriate for passenger. We have to kind of consider each track separately. And that's part of what I have an issue with here is I don't really see a clarification on any of that. And I'm also agreeing with everybody else with the rush to this and the fact that we're going to be locked into this long-term contract and with the idea that so much is going to change in the city in five years, much uh, even more so in 10 years, and to be locked into this for 10 years is um, quite frightening. And I really hope you would consider slowing down a little bit and taking a little more into consideration, because along with the passenger, part of my issues with the passenger rail and uh, being kind of siding more with Greenway is that the passenger rail is, hasn't even been considered a lot, all the details, or at least the public hasn't been informed a lot of that. So my issue with this particular issue is at the rush, so thank you very much. Thank you. How many more people left, or Jackie? Okay, well, you might be the last one. All right. Hi, I'm Jackie Nunez, um, longtime resident of Santa Cruz and um, volunteer for Save Our Shores and founder of The Last Plastic Straw. So um, th this issue is really important to me because I really feel my uh, duty to protect the marine sanctuary. As a sanctuary steward, I take that very seriously, and um, this would just be yet another threat. I think I'm really concerned about this um, uh, partnership with this this rail company and the history that they have with the um, fossil fuel industry, and and just some of the things that I've read into it. So I do, I implore you, like everyone else, to just slow down, take a look at, at everything, and I, I don't really understand the rush in this when we don't even have the study out. Um, so I'm just. Um, you know, seconding, thirding, whatever, fifth motion, and to please be as transparent as possible with us. Thank you. Thank you. 
seeing no one else, uh, we will uh, adjourn to closed session. We're going, I think we're going in the room next door. Are we staying here? Yeah. Okay.